have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. This is a game changer this morning. This, we're shifting gears. As we've been walking through the book of Ephesians, you, we've said it over and over again that the first three chapters is about the wealth of Christ. It is about all that Jesus has done for us, who he is, and how he's brought us in to his very presence. And now, chapters four, five, and six is about participating. It is about getting in the arena. It is going from the classroom, from the first three chapters, to now entering into the arena of saying, Lord, you have created us according to your word. We are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that you have already prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that's why we studied last week that great prayer at the end of Ephesians 3, because God is about to call us to things that are impossible to do apart from him. That we jump in, we pray, and we receive from him, according to that prayer in Ephesians 3, power and love in order to walk with him, in order to keep our attention and our focus upon him, to experience him at work in and through our lives. What's amazing about the progression as we enter into chapter 4 is where Jesus begins, where our walk actually begins. If it's, we're thinking to ourselves and being logical, we would think automatically the Lord would turn our attention onto us personally. Where is our walk? Where is our holiness? Are we in pursuit of him personally? Do I know him personally? But in fact, God begins not with us personally, begins with us corporately. You have to remember that when we come to scripture, the way things are ordered are incredibly important. There is a priority in position and God is placing before us the importance, the vitality, the essentialness of his church that we cannot thrive in a relationship with him apart from his body the church. I want you to think about this for a moment. I want you to understand this and gain this for a moment as we begin to walk through the scripture. That we are called upon to be a part of his body. That in order to thrive and to grow in him, that we must join together. There is, this is not an individualistic sport. This is a team endeavor. And it's more than team. It's family. And we're joined together as a family in our pursuit of him. And the Lord is gonna lay out some really clear commands this morning about how we are to participate in his family. So I hope and pray that you are paying attention, you're ready to go because we are about to see what a healthy church looks like. So in the honor of God's word, if you would stand with me this morning, Ephesians chapter one, or Ephesians chapter four, beginning in verse number one, Paul is writing, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one, a hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every kind of doctrine, by human cunning or craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, 
from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we come to you. And we come to you, Lord Jesus, receiving instructions about your church. Lord, we belong to you. We are your children. Father, may you have your way with us this morning. Father, may you form an incredible, healthy church called Highview. Father, please help us to know our role. Please help us to know what you require. And Lord Jesus, may you and you alone receive the glory. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. In order to help us walk through this passage as you're taking notes, to give it a little hands and feet, because there's a lot going on in these first 16 verses. I'm going to give you a couple, couple guidelines for you. The first one is that we have in the first six verses a call to unity. And that call to unity is going to require two things, character and conviction. Write those down. The first six verses are about a call to unity, and it requires character and conviction. Verses 7 through 16 is a journey to maturity. Don't you love that rhyming? The journey to maturity. That makes it easy for you to remember. And those require God's gifts and his one goal. So as we're walking through the passage, let it break it down for you. Let us you see very clearly where we are going. And let's come back to verse number 1. Let's begin walking through the scripture. It says, I therefore, and you know that therefores are important because it's bringing into account everything that's come before it. It's talking about the first three chapters. Paul is writing, and he gives us once again a, an identity that he has derived. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. Let's stop here for a moment. His identity is coming from Jesus. His, everything that's about to flow out of him, everything that we're about to be instructed in, can not happen apart from a relationship with Christ, apart from an indwelling of him and his power and his love flowing in and out of us. This is a phenomenal time to assess. Do I belong to Jesus? Do I have a relationship with him? That which he is about to call us to is impossible without him. He is Lord. And everything that he's about to call us to is a revealing it's a revealing of whether or not we belong to him. Are we deriving our identity from Christ and Christ alone? Paul is able to say, physically, he's actually a prisoner in Rome writing, but he's actually able to say, and he's actually able to glory in the fact that he's a prisoner for the Lord, that the Lord is using him despite his captivity. God, he's deriving his identity from Jesus and Jesus alone. Is that how we live? Is that how we identify ourselves? Have we received our identity fully from Christ and Christ alone? Do, and do we see these things at work in our lives? Do we see and witness the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, forming this character, giving us a clarity of conviction so that the Lord is glorified in and through us, in and through his church? Let's take a look. He urged, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And this is what that walk should look like. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The first thing is required, the first thing that we're called to is we're called to unity. And I want you to hear me very clearly. Unity within the church is not created by us. It is created by the Holy Spirit. We do not create unity. We keep or guard or maintain unity. But it's the Holy Spirit that creates unity. He's the one that unites us together. He's the one that brings us together. He's the one that forms us into this oneness in this beautiful thing called unity. And we are called upon to obey. We are called upon to follow. We are called upon to maintain and eager with eagerness to maintain that unity. And it begins with our character is Christ. 
being formed in us? Are we exhibiting the character of Jesus himself? Because those characteristics that we are called to in this passage are clearly demonstrated in Jesus and in Jesus alone. He calls us to humility. He calls us to gentleness. He calls us to patience. He calls us to long-suffering or forbearing with one another in love. One of the great calls that we've received with this and another place in Scripture is in Philippians chapter 2. Take a look on the screen for you. Philippians 2, 3 through 5. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And flowing from that, verses 6 through 11, is that great Christological passage where Jesus, his identity is revealed. All that he's done for us. Remember that he says that even though he was in the form of God, did not count it equality with God to be grasped. But yet, what did he do? He emptied himself, humbled himself, becoming a man and becoming obedient to death. Even death on a what? Cross. So that the name of Jesus is what? Lifted up. It's exalted. That his name is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess, every knee shall bow in earth and under the earth, that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That we are called upon to live in the same example, in the same way that Christ has set out for us. That this mind is now available to us in Christ. This humility is now available to us in Christ. This gentleness is now available to us in Christ. This patience is now available to us in Christ. This long suffering is now available to us in Christ. And that we experiencing him and the freedom that comes from obedience. You know that we have a phrase out here that says to know and follow Jesus. To follow Jesus requires obedience. Do you know Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to him? And are you experiencing the freedom of obedience? Take a look first at just this idea of humility. The opposite of pride. I want you to listen to a quote from this great little book called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness by Tim Keller. I want you to listen. There's going to be a highlight up on the screen. He writes, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity makes a brilliant observation about gospel humility. At the very end of his chapter on pride, if we were to meet a truly humble person, Lewis says, we would never come away from the meeting thinking, meeting them thinking they were humble. They would not always be telling us they were a nobody because a person who keeps saying that they are a nobody is actually a self-obsessed person. Think about that. The thing we would remember from meeting a truly gospel humble person is how much they seem to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. Think about this for a moment. True gospel humility is taking an interest in someone else. Not always drawing attention to ourselves. He continues on. I want you to listen to this. Gospel humility is not needing to think about myself. Not needing to connect things with myself. It is an end to thoughts such as, I'm in this room with these people. Does this make me look good? Or do I want to be here? True gospel humility means I stop connecting every experience, every conversation with myself. In fact, I stop thinking about myself. The freedom of self-forgetfulness, the blessed rest that only comes from self-forgetfulness. This is the anti-selfie generation. This is what it means. This is what we're talking about. This means this this freedom of self-forgetfulness. Do we understand the freedom that Jesus brings in and through humility? That this is not somehow to lessen us, this is to free us. Do you hear that? I want you to hear that from the gospel. I want you to hear that from the freedom that is in Christ. That there is a freedom in humility. There's a freedom in taking interest in other people. There's a freedom in gospel humility that allows us to experience the fullness and the power of Jesus. Because we stop worshiping at the altar of the me, myself, and I. I mean, it is exhausting to be focused upon self all the time. And we lose out when we continue to draw attention to ourselves, when we continue to connect everything to ourselves, we lose. 
And the Lord Jesus is more interested in what he wants to do in and through us. He has a better plan for us. He wants us to experience the freedom that is in him and him alone. And he calls us to humility. He calls us to gentleness. Or another way, another way to translate it in your scripture is meekness, meaning that we are under his control. We're submitted to him. Apart from Christ, the greatest character of gentleness or meekness in scripture is Moses of the Old Testament. Moses was obedient to the Lord. Moses followed the Lord. He truly was used by God to bring a great deliverance. I mean, we are called upon to be like that. We are called upon to be under God's control, under his submission, so that we may be free to lead other people to him. That call to patience is to love those around us. Love those even though we may get irritated, even though we may get short. God has the power to bring patience in our lives, to love people and to love them well, and to long-suffering. You know what that means? That means that we are willing to meet unmet expectations and love people anyway. Do we have this in our lives? Do you see the marks of Christ upon your life? Do you see the Lord forming you and shaping you? And I'm telling you, it's where we see this, it's observed in the body of Christ. It's observed when we are around each other, when we allow each other to speak into each other's lives, and we are encouraging one another in the formation of Christ, and Christ becoming real in us. It happened to me this week over a breakfast, over a breakfast with a good friend of mine. We were just talking, and we were sharing stories, and there was a moment where he was about to share a story, which I know was going to be hilarious, but probably at the expense of someone else, and he stopped himself, and he says, no, man, I want, no, I, no, I shouldn't do that. And I said, you know what? I mean, that's a Christ-like move right now. Man, I'd love to have heard that story, but I'm telling you, I'd rather see Christ in you. And that was a mature moment. That was a moment of formation. That was a moment of victory. And I'm telling you, we are called upon to join together to do what? To see Christ formed in us. We are called upon to come to the ground to one another because God has called us to pursue him together. We can't do it on our own. Our relationship with Christ is called to be personal, but it's never called to be private. We need one another. Do you realize that? We need one another to form this identity in Christ. And this identity in Christ is required to do what? To maintain the unity that the Spirit has created. Character matters. How we think about other people matters. How we treat other people matters. Christ being developed in us and our character matters. That's number one. Number two is conviction. That which unites us, his revelation, his word, the truth of God that unites us. Take a look in the scriptures. Take a look at verse number four. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Our focus is to be his revelation, that we have been given one hope. What is that one hope? Jesus. We've all been given that one hope because we were all without hope. And here comes our Savior. Here comes that one hope. We were without hope. And now God, being rich in mercy, according to Ephesians, he now unveils and gives us his grace all over us, given to us. And we are now invited into a new relationship, into that forgiveness of sin where everything is made new, that one hope. And we all enter into that relationship with God by the same person and his name is Jesus and we're given that one hope and there's one God there's one faith there's one baptism that believers baptism there's that one confession there's that oneness that God calls us to he is our focus he is our attention is given to him and to him alone it's not placed on one another it's not placed upon our differences it's placed upon him we are united in him it's amazing how the differences that we have melt away when he is our one focus 
Have you ever thought about that for a moment? Have you ever thought about who the Lord has brought you around and who are you now? Your really good friends. I'm telling you, I'm always amazed, especially in our, my community group. In my community group, I'm amazed at who leads my community group because he grew up a very different way than I grew up. He grew up in a way, I'm telling you right now, there's no lie, because I know he's watching it right now. I'm telling you right now, there's no way my mother would have let me hang out with this guy. His name is Sean Peck. You may not know this guy, but I mean, no way. You know what I'm saying? We grew up in two different ways. But it's Jesus who's brought us together. Jesus saved him. Jesus saved me. And we've become incredible friends. I think about the way the Lord brings us together, unites us together in the power of Christ because our focus is upon him and his goodness, his revelation, not us. Stop drawing attention to ourselves. Let's begin drawing attention to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's character. It's conviction. But the Lord blesses us with his presence. He blesses us with this incredible thing called spiritual gifts in order to lead us to him. Take a look at the scripture. Take a look at verse number seven. But grace, his grace, was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill us, might fill us with all things. What's he talking about? I know this may be confusing. He's quoting from the Psalms. What he is quoting and what is it pointing to is the victory of Jesus. It's pointing to the fact that he descended into our world. And now he is through the resurrection, is now ascended to the right hand of God, meaning in a place of all authority has been given to him. And through his victory, what is he doing? He's bestowing gifts upon us. Because of his victory, because of the resurrection, he's bestowing gifts upon his children for the building up of the church. Now, here's a couple keys with gifts. One, not, there's not a person in here who owns all the gifts. There's not, all the gifts do not reside in one individual person. Why is that important? Because we, once again, we need one another. God has called upon us to unite with one another because we are all deficient in some particular area. Let's take a look at the gifts, beginning in verse number 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. These are just a glimpse of some of the gifts. These are some of the offices. We also, we know from the scripture that the office of the apostle no longer is in existence in the here and the today. That was for the formation, the beginning of the church, to give it authority, to give it momentum. The word for prophecy is a proclamation. And then we have the word for pastors, which is a, a word that we have for shepherding. And then we have the, a, a term for teachers. And what's the purpose of all of these callings? To do what? Verse number 12. This is key to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Now I want you to pay attention very closely. I love this phrase. Every member is a minister. Every member is a minister. Everyone has been given unique gifting in order to build up the body. And real ministry happens when every person is involved in utilizing the gifts that God has given to them. And when those gifts are being used, empowered by the Holy Spirit, here's the key. You know it. Everyone else around you, around you knows it. And the body is built up. Now, gifts are best revealed. Best, gifts are best revealed. Seen and when they, are, when they are observed, not taking a spiritual inventory test. I want you to hear that. I know every one of you in this room probably have taken at some point in time a spiritual inventory test. And you ended up with every gift you really wanted on the test. Am I right? Am I right? Yeah, I know you do. Everyone, oh my goodness, I have the gift of a discernment. No, you don't. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, just, I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing. But the, the true gifts are best observed by the body, when you're in operation, and all of a sudden that gift that the Lord has given to you, a legit gift he's given to you, is seen by someone else, and they point it out. I mean, you really have the gift of encouragement. Man, do you know you have the gift of mercy? Do you realize you have the gift of teaching? And those gifts, some of those gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and 
it's a great way for us to come alongside of those around us and say, man, what gifts are we seeing in action? Are we able to come alongside and encourage people? Because I'm telling you, when the gifts are in action, the body is, done, is what is built up. And I'm telling you, real ministry happens through the members of the church, not through the, the ministry, like the pastors, the, the, the paid staff. That's not where it happens. It happens in the members where ministry, real ministry takes place. And I think about our own church. I think about some of the great ministry that happens in and through you. Now, I know the moment I start mentioning some names, I know some people are going to come to me and they're going to say, well, you didn't mention this person. Man, I'm just mentioning a couple, okay? In a church this large, I'm just mentioning a few and I think of Mary Jo Bagley. I think of Mary Jo who's been serving in our children's ministry, unsung hero who thinks more of those kids than, than anybody. We're, we went to Israel with them and she's buying presents. She's buying gifts for whom? For her children in her class. How do I know that? Because one of my own kids received one of those gifts. I'm thinking that is mind boggling to me that someone would love our kids so well, lead them to Christ. And nobody's giving applause, but she's been serving faithfully. I think of Richard Curry, who goes and serves our largest community group, which is Tell a Bible. You may not even know this happens. Do you realize that Richard Curry gets on the phone with people who are not able to make it to church and over the phone teaches them God's word every Sunday? And it's the largest community group that we have. And he is faithful to love people and to come alongside of them and to teach them God's word over the phone. Think about that for a moment. I think about just Gary Mudd in our church who goes and serves in our prisons and just faithfully goes to the place where, places where nobody else wants to go to bring the gospel. I'm telling you, God is doing incredible ministry in and through you for the, his glory and for his honor. That's what we are called to be about. We are called about to be about his ministry. We are called upon to know the gifts the Lord has placed upon us and do what? Use them. For the building up of his body. And what's the goal? He given us gifts because there's a particular goal. Come back to the scripture. Here we go. Verse number 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To what? To mature manhood, a personhood. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's be very clear. Jesus is the goal. He is our standard. He is where we are headed. We are headed to a person, not a thing. And our maturity is measured by his character, his person, not according to the standards of one another or the standards of the world. It is all about Jesus. Hear that very clearly. It's about Jesus. We are headed towards him together. Why? Take a look at verse number 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every kind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. I mean, we are not to be led astray. And in order not to be led astray, I mean, we must be attached to Jesus. He protects us. He gives us wisdom. He gives us discernment. He gives us maturity so that we are not fooled. And it says rather in verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Are you helping the church grow? Are you helping those around you pursue Jesus? That is is the test. That's the standard. And when we do, the church works beautifully. I mean, there is unity, there's joy, there's encouragement, there is a clarity about mission, and we're moving in the right, in the same direction, and God is being glorified. And it's beautiful, it's amazing, and it's also incredible how it affects not only our lives, but the lives of around us. There's another name I want to share with you this morning. The name is Carol Lang. And I guarantee you no one in this room knows that name. She was a lady who tragically from the flu passed away this week in Hot Springs, Arkansas at the age of 68. But she invested 
and my wife when she was a teenager and taught her how to love Jesus and taught her how to love God's word. What does my wife do today? She comes alongside teenage girls, teaches them to love Jesus and to love his word. Where do you think she got that? Where do you think she learned that? She learned that from Carol Lane, who invested in a young girl named Allison Porter, who's now risen up and now has a ministry of her own. That's what the body looks like. That's what investment looks like. That's what eternal investment looks like. When we take the time, not to focus in on ourselves, but to focus in on one another and to lift each other up, invest in one another to Jesus. And the question is, is that what you're doing? I mean, are you involved? Are you active in the body of Christ? Are you active in this local church called Highview? Are you investing? Where's your character? Is God forming himself in you? Is there something, as we took a look at last week, is there something that Jesus needs to break? Is there something that he needs to remove from your life in order for him to do what? To build. The Lord wants to build. God wants to construct. God wants to form and to shape. Are we allowing him? What needs to go and what does he want to build? Where is your character? Where is your conviction? Do you know your gifts? Have you you asked anybody around you? And are you actively in pursuit of the same goal? And that is Jesus. What's at stake? His testimony, his witness, his mission. People need to know Jesus. And what did Jesus say? They will know you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another. Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, we come to you. And Lord, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful, Lord Jesus, you allow us to be part of your church. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed. Do you know Jesus? Have you surrendered to him? You cannot follow him. You cannot produce what he has called us to apart from him. It's impossible. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that these things are formed. Do you know him, number one? Number two, if you do know him, if you have surrendered to him, are you actively involved in the body of Christ? Are you investing in others? Are you serving What is it that God wants to do in your life? Are you tired of sitting on the sidelines and now it's time to jump in? It's time to participate. It's time to say yes to Jesus and to live for him and live for him alone. Are you ready to take a step of faith this morning and say, Lord Jesus, I'm ready to surrender my life to you fully. Lord Jesus, give us the strength this morning to respond to you, to believe and respond. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen.